Minister Gao, Minister Sum Tham, uh, my fellow Sunway boss and colleagues, and my and uh, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. I have begun rather hesitantly because I'm overcome by first the emotion of being given this honor of an honorary PhD from the University of Cambodia. I thank the University of, California, uh, of Cambodia for this great honor. I'm even more overcome by the emotion of seeing the differences of the University of Cambodia after 15 years of absence. The last time I was here, this was a much smaller operation and a faculty that is substantially smaller. But as I learn more about the growth of the University of Cambodia. It strikes me to be very much in line with the spectacular achievement of the Cambodian economy and society in the last 15 years. Peace is good. And what I want to talk about today is on sustainable development and the bottom line that it turns out is the same as what that occurred to me when I came back into Phnom Penh, that peace is good. I, as you can see, this is my first time that I have a chance to address a, gra a, graduate, a, a crowd of this nature. So I make the big mistake of preparing a BBT, which half the people in the audience cannot see. But the good news is my message is a very simple one. The message is simple only after studying the economies of China, Indonesia, and Malaysia in the last 30 years of my career. Let us briefly remember what is the sustainable development. The United Nations has put forward the 2030 Agenda, which is summarized by 17 sustainable development goals. This force of 17 sustainable development goals could be summarized into four categories. These four categories would be number one, economic development. It means improvement in uh, material well-being as well as the elimination of literacy, the elimination of literacy. The second component is social justice, which is the elimination of uh, social alienation and the reduction in income inequality. The third component is what I call the enhancement of global cooperation in bring about greater harmony in global in, in international relations. The fourth component of the SDGs is the harmony, enhance the harmony of the Earth's natural system. Like the emission of CO2 today is threatening the working of the carbon cycle and threatening the, the environment of the world. How do we see the relationship between these four components? 
One way to think about these components is clearly welfare depends on all four components, but how should we think about how each of the components uh, contributes to welfare? If we call each of the components, the first one A, the second one B, the third one C, the third one D, my first uh, comment to you is that human welfare is not A plus B plus C plus D. That's the wrong way to look at human pro welfare. The right way to look at it is A times B times C times D, which means that if you do not have progress on any one front, such that one of the four components is zero, the final outcome is zero as well. In short, the idea of sustainable economic development, sustainable social progress, sustainable harmonious international relations, and sustainable environmental protection, the four are interrelated and are not, uh, and the existence of one depends on the existence of the others. What I have said is well summarized in the opening line of Leo Tolstoy's book, Anna Karenina. The observation is that all happy families are alike, and each and all unhappy families are un each unhappy in its own way. Basically, all four components are to be fulfilled in order for us to advance. Uh, in human welfare. All of these comments came about when I was studying China. Because how does one think about the Chinese economic performance in the last 40 years? Chinese economic performance is like a fast-moving car. It overtook India in 1978, overtook the Philippines in 1991 and overtook Indonesia in 1997. China has been growing at 9.8% a year. So growth has slowed down. So this makes the concern in the Chinese government of how do you ensure sustainable economic dynamism. So the first question is, if your analogy of the Chinese economy is like a fast-moving car, what are the things that could cause a car to stop? Four things come to mind. The first is what I call hardware failure. The tire comes off the car, so the car crashes. So it's like the 2008 financial crisis. An economic mechanism blows up and the economy is in deep trouble. The second possibility of the car stopping is what I call software failure. The car stops because people are fighting inside the car because they don't like the way it is being driven. They cannot agree on the direction where the car is going. And because of the fight in the car, the car crashes. The third one, has to do with the fast-moving car cannot go far anymore because someone has put a barrier in front of the car. This is a country being crashed because of external sanctions placed on it. Since this is something that is imposed from the outside, I call this a power supply failure. In other words, if your computer doesn't work, it may be your hard disk, it may be a software, or you just have not plugged in the computer to the power supply. The fourth type of reason why the car might crash is because it simply ran out of gas. Just like the example is, the biggest threat to the Chinese economic growth right now is the, shortage, the growing shortage of water in northern China. The average rainfall in China has been constant in the last 30 years. The difference is that 
less of the rain is falling in northern China and more of the rain is falling in southern China. So northern China has less rains, southern China has more rains. But the economy is growing, so northern China is running out of water. Without water, you cannot grow. So environmental challenge is the fourth type of uh, barrier. This corresponds exactly to the four components of sustainable development I talk about. The Chinese leadership has recognized this, but let us look at hardware problems. Hardware problems is something that China has handled well, largely because it is able to look at the outside world, study the rich development experiences of its neighbors, and they went on and make their own version of the development strategies that the Japanese have pioneered. And when you talk about hardware problems, it mostly involves internal stakeholders. So the issue there is really one of political will. How about software failure? Software failure has to do with uh, administrative performance and of the sense of social justice that society feels. Here is something that the Chinese in 2006 thought about as being the greatest threat to economic growth. In 2006, Hu Jintao, who was then the Secretary General of the, of the party, he promulgated what is called the Harmonious Society Agenda, largely because he sees software failure as the biggest threat. Well, when you talk about software failure, we are talking about administrative and governance failures. The solution of it lies in entrenchment of competency, transparency, and accountability. These are reforms that involve internal stakeholders and hence ultimately a question of political will to reform. What is most difficult for China to handle are things that have to fall in the category of what I call power supply failure. The two of them are the international, the state of international relations, and the second is the state of the natural world. And ever since the, uh, Xi Jinping came to part, uh, assumed the office of Secretary General, China has taken a new approach in dealing with power supply. China has reached out to try to expand the harmonious society program of Hu Jintao to a harmonious world agenda. It can be seen in the Belt Road Initiative. It can be seen in the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. It can be seen in the Shanghai uh, Cooperation Council and its defense of the WTO system and its contribution to scientific knowledge in the world. All of this, unfortunately, have caused concerns on, by the established power, notably my own country, the United States, about China as a geostrategic competitor. What we see, the trade war that we see now, is a potential issue that could turn out to arrest sustainable economic development in China. So clearly, what we need, what we have is China is rising to play a role to try to bring about sustainable economic development to itself by contributing to the global supply of public goods. But its actions have upset the geostrategic 
balance of the world. Here we come to what is ASEAN's role in this situation. I think our role, in a way, you, if you understand what is happening, first of all, we know that if relations between China and the United States are very good, such that they agree on everything, that is not so good for ASEAN because that means that we have no choice. If we don't do what the two have agreed on, we will be punished. It's the old story of when elephants make love, the grass gets crushed. When tensions are very, very high, that is bad for us because there's no peace in the world. But when their tensions are moderate, what we see is Obama has his pivots to Asia, and Trump has just signed uh, loan guarantees for loans. Basically, when tensions are moderate, we in ASEAN are wooed by both sides. China has the Belt Road Initiative, and uh, Malaysia enjoys uh, preferential treatment in the Obama's negotiations on TPP. So ASEAN's role is to be a peacemaker in trying to prevent the escalation of tensions from US-China relations. And I think that ASEAN is in a very good role in a very good position to do so. And I would like to propose that the partnership between Sunway University and the University of Cambodia be devoted to the studying, to, to research and come up with uh, an agenda of how to reduce the geostrategic rivalry that exists in this region and ways to address the national security concerns of the countries and yet be able to move on in economic engagement. So this is the agenda in which we should devote ourselves to. And I'd like to thank the University of Cambodia once more for conferring me upon me this great honor of being a member of this great university. Thank you.